fire and flood. An ancient book says that water once covered this planet and wiped out a race. The same book tells of global fire in the future. Were the waters that covered the first world only fiction? Are the threatened fires of doomsday only a fantasy of fear? Is there some strange tie between hell and high water? It is written. This is George Vandam, and today It Is Written presents Hell and High Water. Someone has suggested that if we had no record of a global flood, we should have to invent one. For to take a good look at the surface of this planet is to unlock a fascinating, surprising story written in the rocks. And it's the story of water. Mysterious water lines on mountain peaks, great inland basins once filled with water, disappearing lakes, sea life high on mountain crags, fossils in unexpected places with an unexpected story. All these are a parade of witnesses that something has happened. And everywhere it's the story of water, of destruction and upheaval on a scale never equaled. And before that, a fabulous world beyond our power even to imagine, much less describe. A world with a perfect climate from pole to pole. A world with vegetation more luxuriant than we've ever observed and, and that everywhere. A world able to support animal life of fantastic size and numbers. What a world it must have been. But evidently, it all came to a sudden and violent end. And the Bible says it happened in the days of Noah. Now, we deeply appreciate the courtesy of the Smithsonian Institution here in Washington in permitting us to prepare this program here in the Natural Museum of Natural, the National Museum of Natural History. In fairness, let me say that here at the Smithsonian Institution, there are, of course, many eminent scientists who offer interpretations of the natural world very different from what we shall present today. However, a significant number of scientists, equally thoughtful and well qualified, find disturbing evidence on the other side of the question. What do you say we have a look at some of these highlights? For instance, there is an isolated hill over in Burgundy, France. It rises 1,030 feet above the plain. In a huge fissure near the top of the hill, a split, there are great numbers of skeletons. Bears, horses, oxen, wolves. What were all these animals doing on the top of the only hill in the area? Were wolves and horses feeding together? And how were they suddenly buried? There are similar fissures at different altitudes on the rock of Gibraltar, all filled with the bones of animals. Why? A cavern full of animal bones, mostly hippopotamus, was found on the island of Sicily. Within six months after its discovery, more than 20 tons of bones were shipped for commercial purposes. And then over here in Agate Springs, Nebraska, a great bone bed was accidentally discovered in 1876. What is left of the hill covers about 10 acres. It's been estimated that bones of about 9,000 complete animals were buried on this one hill. We could go on. 
In every case, certain interesting points stand out. These beds of bones are usually found on isolated hills. Animals that are not normally friendly with each other are found together, and they're found together in great numbers. Now, did man slaughter all these animals? Hardly. Did some disease strike them? What disease could strike all different kinds of animals at the same time and in all parts of the world? An animal stricken with sudden disease are too weak to travel to the hilltops. The theory becomes absurd. There is only one force in nature capable of producing the destruction that is evident, and that force is water. What else could have driven these animals in fantastic numbers, friend and foe together, to the tops of the highest hills and then buried them in wild disorder in a common grave? You see, it is evident that many species of animals suddenly became extinct. Great elephants, great mastodons, enormous wingless birds, grotesque dragon-like reptiles that were as numerous as were the buffaloes a few generations ago on our own western plains, and some of them up to 80 feet long. Some of them flew in the air. Great sea dragons, the dinosaurs roaming in great numbers over the plains. What a world it must have been. The day the dinosaurs died, is a mystery to science. What happened to them? Did it get too cold for them all at once? Did it get too hot for them all at once? Were the dinosaurs badly constructed? Hardly. But if they were, then all other forms of life and land and sea and air must also have been badly constructed and succumb to their defects all at once. But the dinosaurs and the mountains of bones are not the only puzzles in the soil. There is coal. Coal, geologists agree, must come from vegetable matter. But certain conditions are necessary to form coal. First, there must be an abundance of vegetation. It must be preserved without decay or mixture with earthly substances. It must be covered up by other deposits so that it can be compressed and excluded from air. Only a sudden burial of huge amounts of vegetable material could produce coal. Did you know that it requires from 10 to 14 feet of vegetable matter to produce a seam of coal, one foot in thickness? Yet there are seams of coal 40 to 50 feet thick. One seam has been discovered in Wyoming that is from 60 to 90 feet in thickness. In Australia, there are seams 300 and 400 feet thick. In other words, it would have required a solid mass of trees and plants at least 3,000 feet in thickness to produce those Australian seams. Why, it staggers our imagination to think how this world must have been like, what it must have been like, and what must have happened to it? Just think of it, friend. Whole forests suddenly buried, forming great beds of coal. And the luxuriant vegetation evidently was not confined to the now warmer parts of the globe. An entire mountain of coal was discovered at the South Pole. Is it any wonder that our generation reels before the remnants of that first world? What happened to bury reptiles and mammals and forests as if in a moment? The only sane and reasonable answer is water. Only one force known to man is capable of accomplishing that sudden destruction, and that force is water. What else could have done it? What else could have caused millions of animals to be killed, collected, and buried on the tops of the mountains? What else could have caused so many species of animal life to become extinct at a single blow? What else could have left 
the surface of this planet in such wild and confused disorder that men for generations have been searching for a satisfactory explanation. This book, friend, this ancient book tells us in simple, understandable language about the destruction of the world by water. Is there a better answer? Now, I'm aware that the modern mind finds it difficult to believe that the first world came to a violent end in the days of Noah, in spite of the telltale scars all over the planet that strongly suggest it. A local catastrophe, perhaps, but not a global one. So many scientists reason. A local flood? Perhaps confined to the Mesopotamian Valley? That's what some say. But listen, friend, I have some interesting questions. Why would God tell Noah to spend more than a century building an ark to escape a local flood? Why not just tell him to move? Why would animals need to be preserved in the ark? Could not God have led these animals out of the doomed valley as, easy, as easily as he could have led them into the ark? And even if all the animals in the Mesopotamian valley were destroyed, were there not enough outside of the valley to perpetuate their species? Does it not border on the ridiculous that Noah should be divinely commanded to build a boat nearly half the size of the Queen Mary, simply to float up and down the valley? Why did not God simply take Noah by the hand and lead him away from doom as he led Lot out of Sodom? And why were birds taken into the ark? Are we to be so credulous as to believe that birds would not be able to fly away from the rising waters of a single valley? The questions persist. The stated purpose of the Genesis judgment was to wipe out a degenerate race. How would the destruction of a race be accomplished by a local inundation? The whole account becomes absurd if the deluge was not worldwide. But that means global catastrophe, nothing less. Unfortunately, global catastrophe is a concept that seems difficult for some to accept in this day of uniformitarian thinking. Now, the principle of uniformitarianism, of course, is the idea that existing processes acting in the same manner as at present are sufficient to account for all geological changes in the past. In other words, if it isn't happening now, it could never have happened. If we haven't seen something just like it, it couldn't be true. That's the reasoning. But could it be that the order of the fossils may be the result of something other than evolution? Could it be just as well explained by the action of the violent waters of the flood? Might not these waters and the accompanying upheaval have had sort of a sorting action? Might it be only natural that certain types of organisms would be buried first. And would not the order of burial depend also upon the relative ability of animals to escape the rising waters? The less mobile, smaller creatures would be trapped first, you see, while some of the higher animals, and especially man, would be able to retreat to the highest elevations before being inundated. Now, I don't deny that there is some degree of order in the fossil record. I only question what this order means. Could it be that the fossil record, the fossil sequence so intriguing to modern man, is not the record of long ages at all, but rather the chronicle written in the rocks of the terrible events of a single year, the year of the Great Flood? Have we been misreading the evidence? You see, there is nothing in our experience that can qualify us to understand the flood of Noah's day. We can't judge it by anything in our time. Here was not a local inundation, a minor catastrophe. The entire planet was involved. And it was not the ravages of water alone that left our world as we see it today. The earth was torn, was twisted. 
and convulsed in a way that our imagination simply cannot reach. Start with rain. Add cloud bursts. Add water gushing forth from the earth. Add tidal waves. Add fire. Add wind. Add volcanoes. Add twisting and turning. Add mountains rising and falling. Add the most violent convulsions, the wildest upheavals. Add anything you can think of. We still cannot begin to appreciate what happened in that day. Not a catastrophe of the moment. Rather, it must have been centuries before the earth quieted down. Centuries in which the principle of uniformity simply was not working. Isn't it unfortunate that the deluge described in this book, which would help us to explain many of the troublesome problems posed by the surface of our planet, I say, isn't it unfortunate that these are routinely bypassed by those who so tirelessly and sincerely seek the answers? In this nervous, apprehensive, jittery generation, accustomed as we are to talk of possible catastrophe on a global scale, it shouldn't be too difficult to construct a picture of what happened in Noah's day. Suppose we try. Dark clouds, the mutter, the muttering of thunder, the flash of lightning, and then rain, the first rain to fall upon the earth. The hearts of men were struck with fear that soon turned to panic. The animals roared about in terror. But the door to the ark was closed. Water everywhere coming from the clouds in mighty cataracts, rivers breaking away from their boundaries, water bursting from the earth. And then came the wild stampede for the hills, men and animals together struggling to the high places. Parents, of course, bound their children to the backs of animals, hoping that they would carry them safely above the rising waters. But higher and higher the water rose. Men and women clung to the great trees atop of the mountains. But these giant trees were uprooted, and men and animals together were plunged into the murky black waters. Noah had been right after all. And as men and women slipped into the turbulent depths, wishing only for one more call from the lips of the man whose warning they had rejected, Hell and high water seem strangely synonymous. Hell and high water, is there a connection? I think you will see that there is. Listen to these words of Jesus. Matthew 24, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. As it was, so shall it be. Evidently, Jesus believed in the scripture record of the flood, you see. He gives no hint here that it was legend or myth or poetry or symbol or anything but literal history. Modern man may question that the flood ever happened, but evidently Jesus did not. Notice his simple, straightforward, incisive pronouncement. As it was, so shall it be. In other words, Jesus staked not only the authority of his mission, but the reality, the certainty of his second coming on the reality of Noah's flood. You see, never forget it, friend. If our ideas of origins, our ideas about the beginnings of our planet, if these are fuzzy, if they're uncertain, if they're confused and unclear, our ideas about our destiny will be the same. If we think the flood never happened, how can God's warnings of future judgment even reach us? That's why Jesus said, as it was, so shall it be. Would you like to listen to these words again, this time from the New English Bible? As things were in Noah's days, so will they be when the Son of Man comes. In the days before the flood they ate and drank and married, 
until the day that Noah went into the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. This is how it will be when the Son of Man comes. Did you notice? And they knew nothing until the floods came and swept them all away. Surprised. And they didn't need to be. Noah had been building that boat for a century and telling them why. Listen, friend, will our generation too be surprised when it doesn't need to be? Evidently. Noah's time was a time of global judgment. Is ours? Listen to the words of the Apostle Peter. 2 Peter 3, verses 6 and 7, the New English Bible. By water, that first world was destroyed, the water of the deluge. And the present heavens and earth, again by God's word, have been kept in store for burning. Listen to that. The first world destroyed by water, the second by burning. Just as in that day waters from within the earth united with water from heaven to destroy the earth, so evidently in the coming judgment, fire from within the earth will unite with fire from heaven at God's command. You and I know the fire is there, awaiting his reluctant use. Hell and high water, Noah's day and ours, strangely alike. God is reluctant. God is patient. God is kind. But finally, because there is no other way, the day must come. And what will God be thinking as the flames envelop the earth? What is in his mind? Is it the exulting of a conqueror over an enemy bent before his power? Oh no. It's the cry of a rejected savior. It's the pathetic cry of a loving father who called his children out of the burning and they would not come. Remember, O oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not? Listen, O oh, New York, how often I have stood beside your spires of steel and called out over Times Square and Fifth Avenue, but you would not hear. O oh, London, how often my voice is blended with that of Big Ben, tolling the lateness of the hour, and you gave no heed. O oh, strange planet in rebellion, how long and patiently I have knocked at your towers of glass and urged you to let me in. I would have saved you from the burning, but you would not. Do you begin to understand God's dealing with sin? However terrifying, however literal, however final the fires of judgment, remember how desperately God has tried to avoid it. He who has called his children out of the burning and they would not come, it is he who finally calls out in bitter disappointment, let the fire fall. Such is the strange act forced upon infinite love by man's free choice. For those who have rejected his grace in that day, there will be no place to hide. But is that all? Smoke ascending from a doomed planet and nothing more? No, friend. Jesus said the meek shall inherit the earth the city of God, with every soul who has made the Savior his hiding place, will defy the flames as the ark once defied the waters, while God makes an old earth new. He'll destroy the last trace of sin from this planet, and he'll leave it clean. He'll make it beautiful. He'll make it satisfying. And he'll make it home, for that's what he's promised. Man's final destination, if he chooses, is not death, not hell, or high water, but life, eternal life. 
and it's yours if you choose. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, maybe we need another Noah, but in any case we need to understand better what happened in his day, so that we can better understand and appreciate the voice that is calling to our own poor souls today in this hour of destiny. What an hour to be alive! But what a decision to make. O oh God, give us the good sense and the grace to accept God's way out. For we ask it all in Jesus' name, that wonderful name, that saving name, in Jesus' name, amen. And now we leave the Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian. And what a subject. Hell and high water. Noah's day and ours. We haven't even begun to cover the fascinating details. But we have an answer to that problem. It's my new book, Hammers in the Fire. Almost a hundred pages of stimulating reading. In fact, we don't think you'll find one dull page. Hammers in the Fire. We want you to have your own personal copy as our gift. Reach for a pencil now, won't you, and we'll tell you how to ask for it. Here is the information you need. Address your card or letter to It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Could there be an easier address to remember? Just It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. It takes only a few moments to write, but it could mean a lifetime of satisfaction. And thank you for your calls and for your letters and for your financial support, which makes it possible for us to bring It Is Written to your area week by week. Now, did you write down the address? It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. And now the time has come to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God.